Okay. So when you're looking at the muscles of the back, right? Um, we divide the, the, the muscles into three groups. We have superficial, then we have intermediate, then we have deep, right? Um, to make life easy, the muscles that I'm going to show are first, which we are going to call superficial. These are muscles on the back, but their movements or what they move is the shoulder. Right. Then the muscles that we are going to say are going to be intermediate. They are going to move the thoracic cage. By thoracic cage, we'll be referring to the ribs. Right. Then the muscles that we are going to call deep, the deeper muscles are the ones that are going to move uh, the vertebral column or the spinal column, which is now the vertebra that we have been describing uh, for the past week, right? So um, in terms of innovation, I'll say something um, a bit embryological. So during development, we, we form somites. I'll, I'll skip and fast forward all the events that happen since it's not an embryology lecture, but at some point, you're going to end up with two groups of muscle in terms of innovation. There is a group of muscle that we, we're going to call epimere, then a group of muscle that are going to be called hypomere. Epimere refers to muscles of the back that are innervated by dorsal rami. Remember the spinal nerve, last time I said the spinal nerve divides into a ventral ramus and a dorsal ramus. So dorsal ramus will innervate um, epimeric muscles, whereas um, ventral rami will innervate hypomeric muscles. Right? But whilst you're still there, right? It is not every muscle on the back that is innervated by, by dorsal rami. Right. So, meaning to say that these muscles, in as much as I've said there is superficial, there is intermediate, then there is deep. I can also classify those muscles into intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic are the muscles that actually form at the back, right? They develop embryologically in the back. Those are the epimeric muscles I was talking about. Right? Then extrinsic muscles, they do not develop in the back. Extrinsic muscles will end up at the back, but during development, they don't develop at the back. So as I've said, we have superficial, we have intermediate, then we have um, we have deep. Right. Superficial, most of the muscles by now, if you have done upper limb, you know them. Right. There is this muscle here, which we call the trapezius. I'm sure you can appreciate that it looks almost triangular and it's broad, right? So I like things that make sense, right? You don't need to cream, right? So let's talk about the origin of this muscle. Can you see where it's starting up there? Then can you see that it's originating all the way coming down in a line so all I need to know is what's in that line, right? So the muscle starts at the skull, base of the skull. So it starts um, at the external occipital protuberance, attaches onto the superior nuchal line. Then instead of attaching on the spinous processes of C1 to C6, remember when I did the vertebral column, I said, the spinous processes of C1 to C6, they're actually covered by a ligamentum 
nuke, such that this muscle attaches onto the ligamentum nuke, then the spinous process of C7 going down. It is not attached on the spinous process of C1 to C6 because there's a ligamentum nuke covering them. Right? And also remember C1, we said it lacks um, a spinous process. Right? So it originates from external occipital protuberance, ligam um, superior nuchal line as well, then ligamentum nuke, spinous process of C7, then spinous process of T1 all the way down to T12, right? In terms of insertion, it inserts into three points, right? Number one, it inserts into the clavicle. Number two, spine of the scapula. Number three, acromion process of the, uh, of the scapula. Those three points, they make the origin of another muscle in the upper limb called the deltoid. Not specifically the same point, the same, same point, but the same prominences. Clavicle, the lateral part of the clavicle, the acromion process, and the spine of the scapula. That's the insertion of the trapezius. It so happens to be the origin of the deltoid. Right. Innervation wise, when you did your head and neck, you say that they were cranial nerves, right? And those cranial nerves were numbered number one to, to 12, not knowing if you added cranial nerves number zero to make them 13 for you guys, but let's just use the basic one to 12. Number 11 was accessory nerve. Accessory nerve is a cranial part and a spinal part. The spinal accessory nerve will innervate the trapezius. It also innervated a muscle in the neck, which you called stenocleidomastoid. Right. Then in terms of function, um, for most muscles, origin is fixed. Insertion moves towards origin. So if you know the origin and the insertion of a muscle, you can actually derive its function, right? So this muscle will elevate the scapula and it also rotates it, right? Then clinical significance of this muscle, why I started with it? Um, when you have problems with um, the accessory nerve, you can get what we call a dropped shoulder. Normally, this muscle is supposed to elevate the shoulder. So when it's it's not receiving innervation, when um, uh, probably a lower motor neuron lesion where there is no innervation, there's going to be there's going to be denervation atrophy. So if it loses the tone, the shoulder will drop automatically. Right. So that's your trapezius. Right. Then there's a very extensive muscle here called the latissimus dorsi. If you read ancient um, anatomy books, they'll tell you that this muscle used to um, used to be wrapped around the heart that was being transported so that it would keep the heart contracting, something like that. So latissimus means extensive. Right? Can you see that it's, it's, it's covering an extensive region? going all the way to the humerus in the arm. Dorsi means dorsal, right? So it is a broad origin, originates from this fascia here, which we call the lumbar fascia. It also attaches onto the spinous processes of the lower six thoracic vertebra. Um, in terms of ribs, it's attached onto the lower three or four ribs. When we do abdomen, uh, particularly the internal oblique muscle will also originate from the lower three or four ribs. Right? I'll, I'll probably remind you guys that when we do the abdomen. So latissimus dorsi, lower six thoracic vertebra, then it also attaches onto the lower three or four ribs. Right? It's also attached onto the iliac crest of the hip bone. Right? 
it it goes all the way up. As it ascends up, it also attaches onto the inferior angle of the scapula. It's quite hidden here. Yeah, we can't see, but I'll show you on, on, on the next picture. It also attaches onto the inferior angle of the scapula. Then it goes to insert into the humerus. I'm sure you remember the pneumonic, a lady between two majors. The lady was the latissimus dorsi, which inserts into the floor of the bicipital groove. And then the two majors were pec major and teres major, which were inserting um, onto the media and the lateral lips. Right. So that's your latissimus dorsi. Innervation for the latissimus dorsi is a nerve called uh, thoracodorsal. Thoracodorsal is um, is one of the nerves that originates from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus coming off in between the upper and the lower subscapular nerves. There's a nerve which is called thoracodorsal. In terms of function, I said it does the same things as the pec major and the teres major with the exception that pec major is on the front, so it's going to flex. Teres major and latissimus dorsi at the back, they extend. Right. The other two things that are common for all three is medial rotation and adduction. So all three muscles, which is the lady and its two majors, they do medial rotation, they do adduction. Pec major being in front, it's going to flex. Then uh, latissimus dorsi and teres major will extend. Right. Then um, so yeah, this is another view of it. So we've removed um trapezius. So this is still your latissimus dorsi. Other muscles that are superficial, which are quite important for you guys, is this muscle here called levator scapulae. You must have met the levator scapulae when you were doing the posterior triangle of the neck. It was forming part of the floor. Levator scapulae originates from C1 to C4. The transverse processes of C1 to C4. And it attaches onto the upper border as well as the medial border of the scapula. Right. And from its name, levator means it elevates scapulae, the scapula. Right. So it elevates the scapula. Innervation for this um, for this muscle is going to be the dorsal scapular nerve. Dorsal scapular nerve, by now having done brachial plexus a bit of it, you must know that it originates from the roots of the brachial plexus, particularly C5. Other books will include C4. Right. Then other superficial muscles, we have the rhomboids here. So there's a rhomboid minor and a rhomboid major. Rhomboid minor originates from um, C7 and T1. Right. The spinous processes of C7 and T1. Then rhomboid major originates from the spinous process of T2 to T5. It's a continuous origin. Rhomboid minor, C7, T1. Rhomboid major, T2 to T5. Right. They are also innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve, which innervates levator scapulae. Right. Function wise, they do uh, medial rotation of the scapula. They retract and medially rotate the scapula. Right. Okay. So those are the muscles that are going to be superficial. Right. Then we have muscles that are intermediate. Right. And remember I said intermediate muscles are muscles that are 
simply moving the thoracic cage. Right. So the intermediate ones, um, there's a muscle called serratus posterior, which comes in two. So when you're doing upper limb, you mention a muscle called serratus anterior. Serratus anterior is um, a muscle on the anterior aspect of the rib cage originates from the upper eight ribs, goes to insert onto the scapula. Fair enough. If you call a muscle serratus anterior, it means you must meet a posterior somewhere. So now part of the intermediate muscles now we are talking about serratus posterior, which comes in two. There is a serratus posterior superior, then there's a serratus posterior inferior here. Yeah. They're described as being rectang rectangular in shape, but we can skip that for now. Right. So the superior ones, they elevate the upper ribs, right? The inferior ones, they depress the lower ribs. So superior elevates the upper ribs, inferior depresses the lower ribs, such that when you do the mechanics of um, respiration, I, I love to call it breathing. When you do the mechanics of breathing, serratus posterior superior will be involved in inspiration when you're doing the thorax. Serratus posterior inferior will be involved in expiration, right? I won't bore you with the origin and the insertion of these muscles. Right. But this one, superior, it inserts into rib two to rib five. That's why it's elevating the upper ribs. The lower one, this one, it inserts into rib nine to rib 12. That's why it depresses them. So there is serratus posterior superior there. Then we have serratus posterior inferior here. Right. Then, so all these muscles that I've been describing so far, these are extrinsic muscles of the back. Right. So now we want to talk about the intrinsic muscles of the back those that are innervated by dorsal rami, right? And by now, I'm sure you appreciate the muscles of the suboccipital region, having done the triangles of the neck. I will mention them in passing again, but let's talk about um, the deep muscles of the back. Right? So what's unique about the deep muscles of the back is, so remember I said the muscles of the back, we say superficial, intermediate then deep the deep group is further divided into deep superficial deep intermediate and deep deep every time i i give this talk um in an in-person uh tutorial or something people laugh and they just get detached from the conversation but it's not hard we're saying the deep group is divided into three. There is that one that is superficial, another intermediate, another deep. Meaning there is deep superficial, deep intermediate, deep, deep. Right. So those that are superficial are what we call the spinal transversalis. Right. I'll show you here. Spinal transversalis has two muscles. Right. So when you're doing back, please remember this. There is a cervical region. There is a thoracic region somewhere here. There is a lumbar region somewhere there. So keep in mind that you may meet splenius services. Services is referring to thoracic vertebra. You may meet another muscle now being called thoracis. We are not talking about the thoracic region. Right. So what I'm saying is spinal transversalis, this is the superficial group for muscles in the deep. So deep superficial, we have spinal transversalis. Which muscles do I have there? 
I have the splenius muscles. So there is splenius capitis, yeah. There is splenius capitis, then there is splenius services, yeah. Right. In terms of innervation, they are innervated by posterior. Uh, not posterior, but dorsal or rami of spinal nerves. Because remember, I said these are now intrinsic muscles of the back. So dorsal or rami C3 to C4. So for now, to so, so for you guys not to lose the plot, let's list the muscles and forget origin and insertion for now, as well as function. Right. Because the, the moment I say splenius services rotates the head to the same side, um, so the splenius capitis rather rotates the head to the same side, so the splenius services, it, it 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 becomes a bit distorted when you then go to deep deep. So let's just list the muscles for now. Deep superficial, we say it's spinal transversalis. I'm counting splenius capitis and splenius services deep intermediate there's a muscle called erector spiny so people misuse this word or abuse the word in, in that erector spine is a group of muscles it's not a muscle per se same way i said spinal transversalis is uh splenius capitis and splenius services erector spiny it's a column of muscles right Are you guys following? Okay. So, erector spiny, there is, there is iliocostalis. Um, I'm sure you can see the spelling there. Iliocostalis. Um, there's a chart. Okay, let me read through it. Yes, all right. So, Intermediate, there is iliocostalis, there is longissimus, then there is spinalis. Right. So there is a reason why I'm not, there is a reason why I'm not just throwing things to say longissimus capitis, Longisma services. The reason is that remember I said there are regions. There is cervical region, there is thoracic region, there is lumbar region. Right. So you will meet iliocostalis services. Right. Um, let me remove my video a bit, it's sticking. Um you will meet iliocostalis services. You will meet iliocostalis thoracis. You will meet iliocostalis lamborum. It's still the same iliocostalis muscle, just that it's in different regions. You will meet longismus services, longismus thoracis, um, as well as the same muscle you see it again um, going down. Right. Just that for the longismus, um, it also has a longismus capitis higher up there. Right. Don't talk about the lamborum for this one. Right. Then there is a spinalis muscle here. Right. So spinalis, you can say spinalis thoracis, spinalis services, spinalis capitis. Though some books argue that um the services part is absent in most individuals. But anatomy is anatomy. There are some people who have a spinalis um, services. Right. So now you know that deep intermediate is a, a column of muscles called erector spiny. This erector spiny has iliocostalis, there is longissimus, and then there is this one, the spinalis. Then when you go to the deep group now,
So this was deep intermediate. Now we're going deep, deep, right? So when you go to the deep, deep, collectively, those muscles have a name again. And the name is transverso spinalis. Deep intermediate, we say it collectively, we call them erector, spiny. Deep superficial, collectively, we call them spino transversalis. Right? Deep, deep, we are calling them transverso spinalis. The muscles are this one, the semispinalis thoracis. Right. So then again, I want to move away from including thoracis. So let's just say semispinalis because there is semispinalis capitis, there is thoracis. Um, it extends all the way down. Right. Then there's a muscle called multifidis. Yeah. So there's multifidis, which is just beneath um, the semispinalis muscle. Right. Then there's the rotatoris muscle, this one. These are the deepest muscles closest to the vertebral column. Right. And um, they also uh, uh, extend the whole regions, but you clearly see them in the thoracic region. Right. You can divide them into the long and the short. Right. Then other people beyond this uh, deep, deep, they have a further subclassification within that deep, um, within that deep, um, within that deep group. Let me see if my video is now um, no longer having problems. So Within the deep, deep, there is another subset of muscle, which um, includes the levatoris costarum. Yeah. Levatoris costarum. Then other muscles, which are called um, interspinalis and intertransversari. Interspinalis meaning it's bridging from one spinous process of a vertebra to another spinous process of a vertebra. Intertransversary, it's bridging from one um, transverse process of a vertebra to another transverse process of another vertebra. Right. Those are still muscles in the, in the deep group, but it's just a minor group. The way I've described it, or the way I've grouped these muscles, get me right, um, I know different books will somehow classify them differently, uh, but this is the most uh, acceptable way of classifying these muscles um, into extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic, we say there is the superficial and the intermediate. Then intrinsic, I say those are the pure muscles of the back, which are the deep, where you divide them into Deep superficial, deep intermediate, deep deep. Right. Deep deep is the transversal spinalis. Deep intermediate, we talked about the erector spiny column with its three muscles. Deep uh, superficial, uh, that's the spinal uh, transversalis with uh, the two uh, splenius. Right. So having done that, I can now start talking about origin and insertion. Right? Because now we can now say there's a muscle called multifidis. It's in the deep group, originates from point X, inserts into point Y. In terms of function, it does this. You can only do that after you classify those muscles. Right? Okay. But before I do that, I want to bring your attention back to the triangles on the back. At least I forget. Mm, 
Okay. Let me zoom in. Oh, I did it. I overdid it. But anyway. There's what we call the auscultation triangle or the triangle of auscultation here. Yeah. And so we have an auscultation triangle or the triangle of auscultation. And you can see that it's quite small and it's very important. Right. So why is it important? Respiratory sounds are better heard when auscultated here. Why? Because as you can see from this picture, this is almost the only part on the back which is not covered by muscles. And the lungs, when you do your thorax, you find that the posterior border of the lung extends from somewhere around C7 going to somewhere around T10 in that region. So the lung also extends into that region at the back. Right. So this triangle of auscultation is not really covered by much muscle and you can best auscultate your lung sounds in that region. Right. So. What are the boundaries of this triangle? You can see from the picture already. Medially, there is the lateral border, this one. There is the lateral border of the trapezius. Right? Laterally, which is this side, what's there? Um, there is um, the vertebral border of the scapula. Right? Then inferiorly, yeah is this muscle which is coming from lower down the lattice mass dorsi. Right. So the triangle of auscultation is really uh, between the scapula, the trapezius, and the lattice mass dorsi. Right. Okay. Lumbar triangle is this one. I'll use the side because of uh, my, my bed, I'll just use the side. So this is your lumbar triangle, right? Um, significance for this one, does anyone know the significance of the lumbar triangle? Um, also known as um, the triangle of petit. Hello. Um, a hint, it has to do with hernia. Does anyone know? I'll, I'll probably take the silence as um, no one knows. But anyway, this lumbar triangle, um, it can be divided into superficial and deep. Right? Um, or maybe let's not say superficial and deep. It can be divided into inferior and superior. Right? The inferior one is what we call the petite triangle. The superior one, um, forgive my pronunciation, but you may need to go Google that one. Um, it's called Greenfelt. Greenfelt, but not green, G-R-A-E, G-R-Y. So you may need to Google that one. Right. They are related to each other. I won't bore you with um, the deeper things about them, but herniation of organs mostly occurs in the superior one, right? So I'll tell you why abdominal organs come here. Um, yes. What do you mean herniation? Oh, okay. Good question. So, um, the simplest definition of a hernia, um, this is whereby you have, say, an organ or with regards to even the abdomen, 
peritoneum are leaving its normal confines or its normal confined borders to go into another area. For example, there are no intestines that you expect in this region at the back, but you then start to see intestines there. That's a form of a hernia. Or you see intestines on your thigh, um, that's a form of femoral hernia or something like that. You, 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 you do more of hernias when you do the abdomen. You get it? Got it. Okay. So the inferior, the inferior lumbar triangle or the petite triangle, um, you can see its boundaries here. Right. It's bounded inferiorly by the iliac crest. This is the hip bone at the back. So it's bounded inferiorly by the iliac crest. Then it's bounded um uh, posteriorly by the latissimus dorsi then anteriorly there is a muscle here which we find on the anterior lateral abdominal wall which we are going to call external oblique so the triangle is between external oblique anteriorly which is the mass of the anterior abdominal wall posteriorly there is latissimus dorsi which is the mass of the back then inferiorly there is there is um the iliac crest. So I, I, I promise to give a reason why things you need here. So when you do abdomen, the anterior lateral muscles, particularly the external oblique, you're going to find that this muscle is attached anteriorly. This posterior part of the muscle is free. We refer to it as a posterior free border. So imagine you you want to pass through, let's say, um, a wall. It's very easy for you to pass through the softest part of that wall rather than the hardest. Maybe you want to drill something. So things that are going to herniate, they are more likely going to herniate into this triangle. Why? Because this muscle, the external oblique, it is a posterior free border. Right. And when you get a lumbar hernia there, you can actually call it petite hernia. Right. So this is the inferior lumbar triangle. Right. Um, Superior lumbar triangle or the Greenfield, whatever, I've never really taught it before. But um, that one, let me see if I can get a picture of a quadratus lumborum. Okay, let me zoom out this one. Okay. Okay, sadly, I can't get a picture of um, the superior one from this kind of views. But um, the superior one is bounded by a muscle called quadratus lamborum, which you find on the posterior um, abdominal wall. So quadratus lamborum, then internal oblique. Those are the boundaries of the superior one. But the one that's more important for you guys to know is, um, is just um, the inferior one. So when people say lumbar triangle, most of the time they are referring to the inferior lumbar triangle, um, which I described as being as being bounded by um, latissimus dorsi, iliac crest, and external um, oblique. Hey. So page 54, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah, that one. So now, these are now origins and insertions of the muscles. Right? It's very hard to teach people origin and insertion. Trust me, it's very, very hard. But it's essential to know. Um, it depends with who you are, what are you studying, what are you studying it for? 
for medical students, um, having gone through the same thing, um, I know we are told um, maybe by our superiors that if you know function and innovation, you'll be good. But for you to be able to remember function, you need to know the origin and the insertion. You can never know how a muscle is functioning until you know its origin and its insertion. I can walk up to you um, at any given time and you ask me function of a muscle and I'll tell you. I I'm not going to tell you because I'm smart, but I'm going to tell you that because at some point I knew the origin and the insertion. Then I translated that information to function. So I don't necessarily need to think about origin and insertion because it's already in my head, but I now translate it to function. So you need to find a way to know the origin and the insertion. Once you know that, you can know the function. You can derive the function. Anatomy, I know most people take it as a cramming game, but yeah, you cram the whole body and in no time you forget it all. Innovation, I think this one I mentioned, levator scapula and the rhomboids, I say dorsal scapula nerve. And when I say dorsal scapula nerve, remember I said it's coming from the brachial plexus C5 and others include C4. Um, this atlas is one of the others. Then trapezius, we said um, it's the spinal accessory nerve. We don't just say accessory nerve like um, this book is writing here. It's the spinal accessory nerve because accessory nerve, which is cranial nerve number 11, it is a spinal part and a cranial part. Then C3, C4, these are for proprioception, um, which differentiates um, the trapezius innervation from stenocleidomastoid. Stenocleidomastoid, um, when you did your neck, it had the same motor innervation, which was spinal accessory nerve. However, its uh, proprioception was not C3, C4, but it was C2, C3. Right. That is my dosi, I said it's innervated by the thoracodosal nerve, which originates from the posterior cord of your, of your brachial plexus. Right. So um, I'm not so sure which which muscles did you guys major on uh, in terms of origin and insertion? Or would you be okay um, if you'd look at the origin and the insertion um, on your own maybe? Or you want me to teach you? The floor is open to say out your thoughts. Uh, I think personally, it's okay. Personally, it's okay to like maybe look at them on your own. Because the moment I say this one is coming from ligamentum nuke, going mastoid process, going skull, sometimes it, it's 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 hard for someone to 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 get the picture of it. Um. It's very hard to teach origin and insertion, especially when most of these muscles are high a lot. I know I mentioned origin and insertion for the superficial and the intermediate, but for the deep now, it's quite hard. I, I know it's it's doable, but it's hard when you're teaching it. Right. Okay. So do you guys have questions on these muscles? But definitely don't forget um, auscultation triangle and the lumbar triangle, because I think at the end of most of my 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 talks, I always give reference to things that are clinical, right? You don't you don't have a patient who's going to walk up to you and um, start telling you about their serratus posterior superior or what. You need to be able then to translate this into clinical information. You're not being trained to be anatomist, but to be clinicians. And for you to be a good clinician, you need to apply all the basic sciences that you learned. And this is one of them. 
Do you guys have questions for, for Masters of the Bank? Personally, I don't. 